The first quasi-linear model that we're going to discuss today is really a bit of a taster for next week's discussion of neural networks. The perceptron was an early connectionist, which is to say, as we would think about it these days, a neural network model uh, for classification tasks that was developed in the 1950s and it designed to be implemented in hardware. The Mark I perceptron machine looked like this. The algorithm was implemented by means of electric motors changing potentiometers in order to adjust the weights of the network. And the tangle of wires was in some ways deliberate in order to make clear that the performance of the algorithm didn't depend on the particular engineered wiring connections, but instead was learned as a result of uh, processing the data. The perceptron demonstrated an impressive ability to solve uh, linearly separable problems and it does it in a very simple and easy to understand and implement way. Certainly in today's computational environment, it's very easy to implement when you don't have to uh, do so with a soldering iron. Almost immediately, the successes of the perceptron were latched upon by overeager boosters and salespeople, and then was overpromoted in ways that could only lead to disappointment. This quote from the inventor of the perceptron, Frank Rosenblatt, is not too extreme. Perceptron may eventually be able to learn, make decisions, and translate languages. But this was picked up by various outlets. Here, the New York Times reported the Perceptron is the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. These are bold claims. They're the sort of thing that you'd expect Elon Musk to say today. Inevitably, the Perceptron fell short of these claims. It failed to deliver on these wild overpromises for reasons that were already well understood at the time. And disappointment in these failures was one of the factors that drove a backlash against neural networks and connectionist uh, learning strategies, which persisted for many years and arguably set the field back by decades. So we often talk about the perceptron as a model, but actually it's not really a model at all. It is an algorithm for training that model. The model itself is basically the bog standard linear model that we've looked at before, a linear binary classification model. It fits a linear decision boundary, a hyperplane in the feature space where the weights vector dotted with the input feature equals zero. It doesn't exactly define a loss function, but it can be conceptualized as using the zero one loss, which we know is not differentiable. It's probably better understood though, as being an attempt to maximize the margin, but restricting the margin to the cases where it is negative. So it will drive the margin to zero, but stop there. This is equivalent sort of to a piecewise linear loss. So the perceptron algorithm is a method for iteratively training such a model one sample at a time. In effect, it's performing stochastic gradient descent on that margin loss. The algorithm looks like this, and it really couldn't be much simpler. We initialize a weight vector to zero or potentially to some other value. It doesn't really matter. We go through the training set, one sample at a time. We make a prediction based on our current weights vector. And then after making the prediction, we update the weights vector like this. Alpha here is a learning rate similar to those we saw in gradient descent before. 
Note that y minus y hat will be zero if the predictions are correct, and so in that case no change is made to the weights. We repeat this procedure until there are no errors on the training set. So how is this algorithm working? Well, first of all, if the sample is already correctly classified, we don't care about it. As far as that sample is concerned, the decision boundary is already in the right place. If the sample is not classified correctly, it effectively moves the boundary towards it. Whichever side it's on, it's on the wrong side, so it just moves the boundary in that direction. Note that if we initialize the weights vector to zero, then whatever happens throughout this algorithm, the weights vector will always be a weighted sum of some of the training samples. This property is something that we'll see again soon. So here's an animation showing an example of the perceptron training algorithm in action. You can see that at each update for a misclassified point, the decision boundary jumps. So the boundary uh, improvement is quite noisy. It jumps all over the place and eventually settles down to a position where it has just managed to separate the two classes. So on the face of it, the perceptron algorithm is pretty cool. It's extremely easy to understand. It's extremely easy to implement. There's a hyperparameter alpha, but it turns out that that doesn't really matter. It affects the speed of convergence and possibly the smoothness of convergence, but it doesn't affect the fact of it. It turns out that the perceptron algorithm is guaranteed to converge if the data is linearly separable, although it won't necessarily converge to the best possible boundary. If the data is not linearly separable, it is guaranteed never to converge. The algorithm will loop forever and there will always be something wrong that needs to be corrected. Moreover, this looping may involve long cycles that are difficult to identify and difficult to find the best possible failed solution in. The big problem with the perceptron algorithm then is that it doesn't work for non-linearly separable problems and lots of problems aren't linearly separable. There are a number of variants that try to mitigate its limitations by keeping track of all of the visited solutions, for example, or by starting a new perceptron every time you have a failed prediction and then taking a vote over the ensemble. But for our purposes, the perceptron is not particularly useful in itself, and it really serves two functions. First of all, it's an important building block for much more sophisticated and capable neural network methods, which we will discuss next week. In fact, probably the most common form of a neural network model or deep neural network is known as the multi-layer perceptron, even though uh, the perceptron is not a model and the multi-layer perceptron does not use the perceptron algorithm in training. The other reason that the perceptron algorithm is significant is as an object lesson in the problems of over-promising and under-delivering in machine learning and AI, and these are problems that still occur today.